Hello Bio 130 students. This week we are going to cover the urinary system and this first video will cover the major parts where a later video will cover some diseases and disorders that could afflict the urinary system. Now today though we are going to include a little bit of biochemistry which is essentially some enzymes and processes that the urinary system helps with. Now, the urinary system is very critical in liquid waste removal, where the digestive system, you would see solid waste eventually leave the uh, large intestine. Here, the urinary system is helping with liquid waste. And it's also important for maintaining various forms of homeostasis. Homeostasis is simply uh, the proper conditions of the body. For example, the proper amount of, say, sodium ions in the bloodstream or other components that might be circulating and not having too much or too little of any particular component. The major structures and organs of the urinary system are, <clears throat> are the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra and it's going to be pretty much not as intense structure wise as the digestive system was contents of urine that the body likes to get rid of it is for the most part water and it often and it of course contains the compound urea which is a waste product from your body metabolizing protein molecules. There is also urobilin, which is essentially formed by gut bacteria acting on bilirubin. It is one component that gives urine its characteristic yellow color. And often what you will see is that if urine is not yellow or not faintly yellow, this could be a sign of issues in your body, whether you're producing too much of one toxin or you're not efficiently getting rid of one. There is also creatine, which is another waste product from natural muscle metabolism, bile byproducts from bile from the liver, ammonia is another big component which is produced by gut bacteria. As it is flowing through the bloodstream, the liver will convert ammonia to urea which then flows to the kidneys, and then also various forms of salt. So your urine, it's not just water and urea. There are actually quite a good number of waste products your body makes that it can only efficiently get rid of through liquid waste. And just to give some idea of what a lot of these waste products look like, what you can notice is that a lot of them have nitrogen atoms in it. Now, some of this information is not going to be on an exam, and you will have plenty of time to look at the exam to make sure that you, well, we're also going to prepare for the exam. Anyways, uh, talking too much. Just, just something I wanted to point out as far as the chemistry size that a lot of the waste products you're trying to get rid of, your body will try to get rid of, contains a lot of nitrogen components. So that should be a sign that there are many waste products that your body does not want to have. And let's see, as far as the urinary system, we're going to start with the kidneys. And for a typical human being, we have two kidneys, which are one on either side of the spinal column, more or less. So these are going to be located on the posterior side of your body, toward the back. The left kidney is located slightly superior than the right kidney due to the presence of the liver. And the bean shape is what helps distinguish the kidneys from any other organ of the body. The concave side is located medi medially, or the concave side of the kidney is what is located toward the center of the body or toward the spinal column, whereas the convex side is located laterally. That's just a way of showing that you can talk about a particular organ, but you can talk about, say, a superior side, a medial side, or a superior side, an inferior side, or in this case, 
a medial side and a lateral side. And let's see. We also have the kidney is divided into what are called renal pyramids. And each contains well over a million nephrons. And here's essentially what the inside of a kidney really looks like. Where essentially waste products or, well, blood with waste flows into the kidney. And then a lot of those waste products get filtered out into urine so that fresh, clean blood can be circulated back. What is important to show is essentially what I'm highlighting right here. That's more or less one individual renal pyramid. And there are going to be plenty throughout. And inside each renal period are, or renal pyramid are just going to be plenty of what are called nephrons. And on the right side, that's just the right most image is essentially what every nephron looks like. There's going to be a glomerulus, which is going to contain a Bozeman capsule. This is essentially a collection of capillaries. And here you will see a lot of waste entering the nephron loop, but also the blood artery that goes into the Bozeman capsule. It also continues to wrap around the nephron loop multiple times just so that if waste doesn't get absorbed first in the Bozeman capsule, it may be able to transfer into the nephron loop later down the line through osmosis. Or if necessary, water can be absorbed away from the uh, nephron and back into an artery to be transported later through a vein. Now, as waste travels through the nephron loop, it eventually goes into a collecting duct, which is going to be used to transport urine into the ureter for uh, disposal. Now, kidney, kidney function. Kidney function. Kidneys, they do quite a lot. And one of their major functions is actually is actually water, water homeostasis or maintaining proper water levels in the body, especially in the bloodstream. And by doing so, kidneys, they control how much water is in the blood by simply changing how much water is reabsorbed away from the tubules of the nephron back into the artery that travels around the nephron. And normally, nearly 100% of the water is returned to the blood through osmosis. To continue into water homeostasis, here is what happens. Hormones that stimulate water reabsorption back into the artery would be antidiuretic hormone. This is a brain hormone that increases channels in collecting ducts allowing water to pass from the urine into tubule cells and then back into the blood. So essentially, antidiuretic hormone helps blood leaves and goes back into the arteries. Now there is also aldosterone. aldosterone. This increases the reabsorption of sodium and chloride salts and in doing so, by absorbing, by helping reabsorb salts from the nephron loop back into the bloodstream, by increasing the salt content, this further encourages water to also leave the nephrons and enter back into the bloodstream by osmosis. So there are multiple ways that your kidneys can help water go back into the bloodstream. Now there is also heart hormone, which minimizes water reabsorption. This is called atrial natriolytic peptide, or ANP. And this essentially increases the excretion of sodium and chloride. In other words, 
it increases the amount of sodium and chloride ions that remain in the nephrons and therefore will travel and be released in your urine because these salts are not are because these salts are remaining in the nephrons this encourages water to actually also remain in the nephrons and not leave back into the bloodstream so antidiuretic hormone aldosterone they help water leave the nephrons and go back into the bloodstream. Anti-natriuretic peptide, AMP, does the opposite. It helps water stay in the nephrons. And this is in case you have too much water volume in your blood and you're diluting important blood components and you need to not reabsorb water. The kidneys also help with balancing acid and base pH in your blood. And here's essentially how that happens. Kidneys can regulate pH of the blood by controlling the excretion of hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Now, hydrogen and bicarbonate, they essentially can combine to form carbonic acid. Now, here's the situation. If for low pH, or low pH can result from high hydrogen ion concentration. Therefore, if there's too much hydrogen ions in your blood, then your blood's gonna be too acidic and your kidneys are gonna want to excrete those excess hydrogen ions into your urine. Now, if your blood pH is too high, which is a situation, if your blood pH is too high, this could be because you have too little hydrogen ions in your bloodstream, which results in your blood being too basic. Essentially what happens is that carbon dioxide and water can react to form carbonic acid in the blood. Some of it breaks down into hydrogen and carbonate ions. So, but it is possible for hydrogen and bicarbonate ions to recombine as carbonic acid. The key is that your kidneys will help either excrete hydrogen ions if your blood is too acidic or not excrete or diminish the excretion of hydrogen ions if your blood is too basic. For these situations, I would just expect you to really know essentially the basics of what's happening. The kidney is helping maintain acid and base homeostasis or the kidney is helping maintain water homeostasis. Not necessarily the fine, the specifics, the exact specifics of what's happening. And to continue, essentially hydrogen and bicarbonate ions, they enter the nephron and then bicarbonate is selectively reabsorbed leaving hydrogen ions to be excreted in the urine as waste. Reabsorbed bicarbonate ions can then essentially neutralize hydrogen ions in the blood, forming carbonic acid. The removal of hydrogen ions raises the blood pH, pH making, it, making the blood less acidic. So this is sort of a two way of getting rid of of assisting your body if your blood is too acidic or your blood has too many hydrogen ions. Essentially, hydrogen ions can be excreted into your urine while bicarbonate ions are reabsorbed and those bicarbonate ions can then combine with other hydrogen ions and form carbonic acid, which essentially removes excess, which also further removes excess hydrogen ions from the blood. Now, once carbonic acid is formed, it can then travel to the lungs, where it essentially breaks down into carbon dioxide and water, which you will exhale. Kidneys can also function into balancing electrolyte homeostasis or maintaining proper salt levels in your blood. Kidneys maintain homeostasis of electrolytes by controlling the amount of excretion 
into the urine. In this case, and I'm just going to change extraction here into excretion. Cool. Essentially, there are plenty of different uh, there are plenty of different ions that your kidneys can help balance. One of them is, and again, this is just I don't need you. I will not actually expect you to remember all of these ions. Just know that the kidney helps balance the blood levels of different ions. One of which could be sodium. Sodium is needed for proper function of mus muscles and neurons and regulation of blood volume and blood pressure. Over 99% is typically reabsorbed back into the blood from the nephrons. And then potassium is another ion. It has, a, it has many similar functions to sodium and about 60 to 80% of potassium ions that are filtered in the kidneys will eventually be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Another form of homeostasis that goes into a negative ion would be chloride ions. This is a chloride, chloride ion is a very important electrolyte. It helps in regulating pH and cellular fluid vol volumes. For example, the amount of fluid inside a cell and also helps establish electrical potentials, which are critical for neurons and muscle cells to communicate. About 90% is typically reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Calcium ion, uh, as a mineral, it composes bones and teeth. As an electrolyte, though, where as an electrolyte, basically meaning instead of being solid calcium, as calcium positively charged ion, it assists in the contraction of muscle tissue, stimulation of cardiac muscles, so your heart and release of neurotransmitters by neurons in the brain. And throughout the body. There is also another positive ion that the kidneys help balance, which is magnesium ion. And magnesium, it's a positive ion that's useful in balancing the charges the negative charges of other molecules so that your body is not collecting a large amount of negative charge in one particular area. Otherwise, it would repulse itself. Now, this is a situation for adenosine triphosphate, which is the molecule created in our mitochondria that's used for energy throughout the body. Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, it consists of components that have plenty of negative charges on it. So in order for DNA to be stable, it needs magnesium to come near it. And essentially, the positive charge of magnesium helps balance the negative charges throughout a DNA chain and also an RNA chain as well. DNA is essentially your genetic material in your nucleus. Of cells, whereas ribonucleic acid, RNA, is the genetic material used to synthesize proteins. And just to say it one more time, magnesium as a positive ion helps balance the negative charges on those molecules below. Uh, another function of kidney is blood pressure homeostasis making sure your blood pressure is not too high, causing you to have many issues, or too low, causing you to possibly faint. Essentially, as water content in the blood increases, this also increases the pressure exerted on your arteries and veins. More blood volume equals greater blood pressure. In the opposite, though, if you lose too much blood, this will lead to lowered blood pressure. The kidneys assist by controlling the concentration of sodium ions in the blood and urine. And essentially where the sodium ions are, blood, water will naturally flow to them. 
So if sodium ions are left in the nephrons, water will leave the arteries and go into the nephrons and then be excreted as urine. If sodium is in higher concentration in the bloodstream, then water will leap from the nephrons into the bloodstream, thus increasing blood volume and blood pressure. Now, when blood pressure is too low, in order to pl push blood through the kidneys, or let me put it this way, when blood pressure is too low, it can be hard for the body to push blood through the kidneys to filter the blood. If blood pressure is too low, it will not be effective at being pushed through the filters in the kidneys. Under this situation, the kidneys will release an enzyme called renin, and this starts the release of aldosterone, which increases the blood pressure through water reabsorption from the nephrons back into the blood arteries around the nephrons, thus allowing the blood pressure to increase to a point where the blood can efficiently flow into and out of the kidneys. Now the kidneys also produce a variety of hormones. One particular important hormone is calcitriol. The kidneys will convert inactive vitamin D into calcitriol. What happens is that it travels through the blood to the intestines, increasing absorption of calcium from food. So if you have a calcium deficiency, your kidneys can help convert an inactive form of vitamin D to an active form of vitamin D to stimulate the absorption of calcium further down the line in your intestines. Kidneys can also pr produce a hormone called EPO, which is erythropoietin. And what EPO does is that it, well, this EPO is released in response to low oxygen levels, also known as hypoxia. When you have too little oxygen in your blood, EPO will be released. And this essentially stimulates the production of new red blood cells in the bone marrow. Therefore, that way, because you will have more red blood cells, you will have more red blood cells to absorb oxygen in the lungs and carry it throughout the rest of the body. Now, that was a lot for the kidneys. We're actually pretty close to wrapping up the basic structures of the urinary system. So no joke, the rest is just going to be waste traveling through the body to be excreted. Once, ur once urine is ready to leave the kidneys, it will travel through the ureters. And these are basically just tubes that attack the kidney, that attach the kidneys to the urinary bladder. Urine will typically flow, or urine generally flows to the bladder through gravity. Like if we're standing up, gravity assists the flow of urine from the kidneys down to the urinary bladder. However, peristalsis can be used to help push urine toward the urinary bladder. If say we are laying down on our backs, say during when we are sleeping or laying down for any other reason. So basically similar to how the digestive system has peristalsis to push food in the proper direction, the ureters also have peristalsis working to push urine toward the proper direction of excretion in case we are not standing directly upright. And under normal conditions, small amounts of urine will flow down the ureters every 10 or 15 seconds toward the urinary bladder. 
Now, the urinary bladder. This is a hollow structure that stores urine before your body is ready to release it. And under normal physiology, the urinary bladder can typically hold two to three cups of urine. Now, there are times when, say, for in many men, a prostate issue that could push pressure on the urinary bladder, preventing it from actually storing the maximum amount of urine, thus increasing the amount of times a man will need to or a man will need to use the restroom. But under normal conditions, your urinary bladder should be able to store two to three cups of urine before it's time to release. And when it is ready to release, muscles above push on the urinary bladder while muscles below release, thus allowing urine to be forced out of the urinary bladder and exit through the urethra. So, and then the urethra is just essentially the exit point of the urinary system. So, to basically cover the big component of the urinary system is the kidneys, and then once waste is ready, once liquid waste is ready to leave the kidneys, it will travel through the ureter tubes, be stored in the urinary bladder, and then when it comes time, muscles open up beneath the urinary bladder, giving an opening for urine to leave, whereas muscles above the urinary bladder will push on it to help force urine out even faster. And then it will lead through the urethra. So kidneys, ureters, bladder, urethra. As part of this week's discussion activity, just discuss uh, information presented in these in this lesson, particular insights you may have from life experience or insights you gained or were able to connect from the lesson material and or information and experiences you may have had concerning the urinary system. You don't have to do all this, all you don't have to do everything that I just said, but at least post a thread discussing one of those topics. You will also be responsible with, as always, responding to one of your classmates' threads about the insights that they discussed. And so, uh, getting close to just getting past the 28 minute mark, it is a pleasure to have you guys in this online iteration of basic anatomy. Looking forward to the next lesson on disorders of the urinary system.